come to you this morning, and we know you're here, and we're thankful that, God, that you are faithful to us no matter what. And even when we're not faithful, God, you're faithful to us. And so we, we give you praise. We bless your name, Lord. And so we worship you today. And as we uh, hear from you today through the, through the music and, and through your word, I just pray, God, that you would, that you would touch our hearts and you change us. And so we ask this in your name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you. How are we? Is everybody good? Well, good. I know uh, I, I just introduced myself. My name's Joe. For some of you that hadn't seen me for a while, and I do have a suit on that might have thrown you too. So we're glad glad to see you this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, I ask you to do one thing. If you rip this uh, trifold off here in your bulletin and um, drop, fill it out and drop it in the offering plate, I'd like to get a record of your visit. Now, a couple things. If you're in, tuned in by um, way of Facebook. Thanks for tuning in as well. You'll notice inside your bulletin there's a little card here. And um, one of the things we're going to be doing in, on October the 6th is we're going to try to do um, a thing called Invite Your One. Now Invite Your One is something where we're all going to take a just take one week and invite somebody. So I want you to think right now and start to begin to pray for who it is you could invite. I've been thinking about that. Who could I invite? Most of my friends go to this church already, and I, I see them all the time. So what, who could I invite? Well, I started thinking, well, I got some folks that I drink coffee with every once in a while, and I know a couple of them don't go to church anywhere. And there's people that I go to the gym with that I know don't go to church anywhere. So I'm going to ask some of them to come, and, and uh, I want you to think like that too. Think about who you could invite. Actually, Jim and I were in a race, and Jim beat me because my guy... I asked uh, that I'm going to ask the one I'm feeling like I'm going to target. He um, didn't come Tuesday or Thursday to coffee. Those are the two days he usually shows up. I don't know if he knows I'm targeting him or what, but he didn't show up Tuesday or Thursday. So Jim got his person, and he put his person already up there. So Jim uh, Inslee's already got his guy. I'm going to have mine by next week. And so you start thinking, but in your bulletin there is a card. One of them is for you to remember that person and pray for him. Uh, and then the other one is, is just for you to hand to them and you kind of fill it out. This is October 6th and I'm a guest of whoever. And then we're going to take those and uh, we're going to put, when they sign them, put them up there. And uh, we're going to try to have a good day that day and try to have a big attendance. So be in prayer for that. Now, one other thing in your bulletin, you'll notice that there's the Wednesday night classes are kind of listed there. You can look at that, pray about it. And then uh, if you would... If you'd get that back to us, we'd, have, we'd like to have the right amount of books uh, for, for that. So if you would, uh, get that back into us. Um, now, we are glad that you're here with us, and here's what I'd like you to do. If you would, stand with a big smile on your face and greet those right around you. His name 
Listen as the choir sings, Here I Stand. We've, we've sung about his blessings. Come thou fount of every blessing. All the blessings we have come from him. We've sung about his faithfulness and all the new, the new mercies each morning that he brings upon us. Of all the blessings, that's 
probably the greatest one that, that he shed his blood for you and me. As we sing these next two songs, tell it to Jesus and I must tell Jesus. Think about the, the times that he has saved us, that he's rescued us, that we've called upon him and, uh, and that he has come and ministered to you and seen you through trials and tribulations. Because in just a little bit after that, we're going to sing, give thanks with a grateful heart for all of those things, for salvation, for eternal life through Jesus Christ, for his care and love of us in this life. We sing hymn number 451, Tell It to Jesus. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you Anxious, what shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You know other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. And we sing hymn number 455. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior. One who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. He all my cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. 
Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Our ushers are going to come forward and the choir is. Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord, and, and uh, being able to come and worship you, Lord, freely. Lord, we just thank you that uh, Brother Joe's back, and, and we just uh, thank you that he's had uh, safe travel, and, and uh, Lord, uh, may the lives that he's touched, Lord, just uh, be examples for you. Lord, we just uh, ask that your blessings be on these offerings, and, and uh, Lord, that we might just be able to use them to, to glorify your name, Lord, Lord, just... Uh, Help us to go out in this community, Lord, and just freely share your love. We just thank you for uh, your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing this, think of all the blessings that God has given to you. Just in this last week, maybe some ordinary miracle. <laughs> maybe something special. But we give thanks to God. Most of all, for his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son and now let the weak say I am strong let the poor say He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son.
Well, amen. It's good to be back with y'all today. Glad that you're here. Hope you've had a great weekend this weekend. And uh, I just want to say um, I appreciate Matt and uh, Jim and Sean filling in for me. I know that I heard they did a great job, so we appreciate uh, them doing. I'll tell you what, we had a great time in the Ukraine. A uh, couple, I guess it's almost been a month now since we left. And uh, September the 8th, that's about, what, about three or four weeks from now. We're going to do, three weeks from now, we're going to do a presentation on a Sunday night. I know that John Montgomery took about 1,600 pictures, so we won't look at them all, but he did take some great pictures, and we got some great stories to tell you. So uh, make plans that night on the, on the September 8th. We'll, we'll get together, and we'll, we'll do some, uh, we'll just tell you some great stuff that happened, some exciting things. Now... Let me tell you what we, we tend to do here. We tend to walk through books of the Bible. Um, we go verse by verse. The reason why we do that mostly is because we want to know what God's Word said. It doesn't matter what Joe says. It matters what God says. And so we look, we really just walk through books of the Bible, mostly. Um, and this morning, we're going to start a new book. We're going to be looking at the book of 1 John. So here's what I want you to do. If you have your Bible, I invite you to grab it. And um, turn to the book of 1 John and say, well, Joe, Joe, where is it? Well, here, here's a good, it's right after 2 Peter and right before 2 John, all right? So right in there, if that helps you any. It's actually by the back of the New Testament, kind of. And uh, if you'll start in the back and kind of work, you'll, you'll see it. Now, this morning what we want to do is kind of just do an introduction to this book, maybe get a little flavor of what's going on here. And um, let me say a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll kind of jump into some things here. Lord God, we come to you this morning asking that you speak. This is your word, and so as we, we begin to do some spade work, and we begin to look at this book, I pray that God, by it, that we may be changed. We know that your word, uh, it, it says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing your word. And so we want to hear what you have to say to us. And that's, God, uh, why we're looking at this book. And so, God, speak to our hearts. And we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so when, when I refer to the, the book of 1 John, basically one of the things is it's actually a letter. And you may or may not know that, but most of the books in the New Testament are actually letters. Like Colossians is written to the people of Colossae. The, the book of Ephesians is written to a group of people in Ephesus. Right? And so what, you're, what we're actually looking at here when we look at 1 John is, is really, it's a letter. Um, and I, I told the fir first bunch this, you, you all will get this way more than them. A bunch of young people in the, in the first service and they don't really get this, but um, uh, getting mail used to be a fun process, didn't it? Like today, mail is, they, they, these young people, they don't even have a clue. I put myself... Uh, and, and the older crowd, because I've, I used to get mail. How about you? Now when you get the mail, you don't get anything hardly good in it. Used to be a thing where you looked forward to getting mail. Our, our text messages, used to, you used to have to seal them in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and mail it. That's how you did a text. But uh, now they don't, they don't really get that. They think, you know, those are instant. But before, getting mail was, uh, sometimes it was a joyous thing, right? And I remember when we first got married, Christy and I, when we first got married, um, when we moved to Texas, we, we were kind of homesick sometimes, and we, you didn't see a lot of my friends and stuff, and so I always enjoyed getting mail, and so I always do, do this. After I came home, if I was working or whatever, I'd say, Christy, did you check the mail? And I, she, I was doing that, I was going like this, because I was wanting to get to the mail first, because we always had a thing to try to get to, the, if she forgot, we'd both run to the mail, and we'd take off try to get the mail first, and we wanted to see what was in it, because... A lot of times there's something good in it. Like, like when you just check the mail, there'd be bills sometimes. You might have bills. You might have um, uh, uh, ads from stores. You might have po political ads. You'd have all these things. But other times there'd be good stuff like something from a friend or something from your parents. Like if, if it was my parents and it was a card, I'd shake the thing, try to find the check in it. You know, those kind of things. It was good. Um, now... Uh, since the invention of email, my mail has gone down. How about yours? That you don't get, it's not like it used to be. But there's one thing about mail and email that, that's always stayed the same. Um, it, it's this, the first thing you do before you open an email, 
or before you open a letter, most of the time, the first thing you do is see who it's from. Am I right? Like if it's, if it's from, if you look at your emails and it says Best Buy or Walmart or Amazon, what do you do? You just hit delete. You don't care about that stuff. But if it's from a friend, if it's from your parent or whoever, um, you're going to open that, right? You want to see what it's about. And it's the same way with letters, um, especially in the New Testament. What you'll find is we need to find out who wrote this letter so that we can understand a little bit about the letter. Um, and here's something you'll find about 1 John. One of the things you'll find is as you read this is the author's name is not mentioned anywhere in this book. Like Paul, when he would write a letter, and you'll notice this in Colossians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, whatever, it always says Paul, an apostle chosen by God or something like that. And you know who wrote the letter because it's Paul. Almost all, Paul did that in all his letter except for Hebrews if he wrote Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, but a lot of people think he did. Anyways, um, but there's some overwhelming evidence, both internal and external, that say the writer of this book here was John. Uh, and most of the church fathers, all of them agree to that John wrote this. Now, here's the question. There are two prominent Johns in the New Testament. Did you know that? The first one is a guy by the name of John the Baptist. Everybody remembers him. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. He's the one that baptized Jesus uh, in the Jordan, you remember. And he's also the guy, not only did he eat locusts and honey, but um, one time he got the king a little bit stirred up because he was telling him that he shouldn't marry his brother's wife. Right, you remember that? So the king th throws him in jail and then the king's wife turns around and she hates him you know, for, for reasons, but she hates him, and so she has his head cut off and brought to her in a platter. Now, we know it was probably not that John because that John died way early. So there's another John that's prominent in the Bible, and that John, let me find my notes here, was the apostle John, the, the disciple John. Um, John was a, a fisherman by trade, and you'll remember um, that John, when Jesus called him, was out fishing. And, and Jesus says, come follow me. And they dropped their nets and they followed him, right? Now, um, most people think that when John started, when he was out fishing, he was probably a teenager. He was a very, very young man at the time that Jesus called him. His dad's name, does anybody know, you Bible scholars, what was uh, John's dad's name? Zebedee, that's right. You were in the first service. Zebedee was uh, his dad's name. He had a brother named James. James and John, right? Uh, and James and John and Peter were in the inner circle with Jesus. Now, Jesus had the 12 disciples who followed him, and he had other people that were following him as well. But then he also had the three, James, John, and Peter. And they, they were kind of like the inner circle. They were the only ones, James and John and Peter, were the only ones to see the raising of the daughter of Jairus. You remember? They were the only ones that were up on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus you know, his, his uh, clothes turned white and Moses was standing there and Elijah, you'll remember. So they were the ones that got, so John was one of those. Um, now, there's one thing that was kind of interesting as I was studying this about John that I thought was kind of cool. It, it's actually a church tradition that um, after Jesus ascended, John was one of the leaders in the church. Uh, he's one of the leaders in the, in the church of Jerusalem and, and uh, actually around. And so... Uh, he, got, he gets picked up by the emperor Domitian, uh, and Domitian sends him to death. Uh, he says, you're going to die for this. And so he says, the way you're going to die is you're going to die in the Colosseum, and you're going to die by a vat of oil getting heated up to boiling, and we're going to drop you in it, and you'll die. Uh, in fact, back then, a lot of Christians were killed by the Romans, Right, right, right when Christianity was new, they, they persecuted them. In fact, um, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, it says that a lot of Christians were sewn in, in skins and, and with wild animals, and they just kill them. And people, they did that for entertainment. They killed Christians. Uh, so John is sentenced to death by, uh, uh, according to church tradition, by being lowered in a vat of oil, boiling oil. So he's getting thrown into this vat. Um, and he doesn't react like the people want him to. So as he's going, 
uh, up to this vat. They're going to drop him in. He's preaching, as the story goes. He's preaching to the people in the Colosseum. And all of a sudden, they drop him in, and he just continues preaching. Um, this, is, this is church tradition, that he, he just kept preaching to the people, and they're listening, and they're waiting for him to cry out. You ever seen those cartoons where it's like Bugs Bunny, and, they're, and they're, those guys are pulling their beards and everything, and they're, they're putting a big pot, under, and Bugs Bunny's in it, and he's cutting up carrots, and he's like taking a bath in there? Well, that's what John was doing. John was sitting there preaching, and they're waiting for it to get hot and him to start screaming. He never does. So it's kind of interesting that he, he, he does all this. He, he sits in this boiling, and so finally, after minutes had gone by, the emperor Domitian says, get him out of there, and he has to go to plan B, and plan B is to set him on Patmos, and so he exiles him to Patmos. Then, uh, so he stays there till the emperor dies. The next emperor actually pardons him, and he goes back to work in Ephesus, and he spends the rest of his days there. Now, catch up with my notes. He lived to be an old man. Uh, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, he lived to, to be 100 years old, John did. And um, John wrote five books of the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, which is all about salvation and Jesus, who Jesus is. He writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then he writes the book of Revelation. Now, and I don't know what order. I think maybe he wrote Revelation before he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. But uh, while he was on the island of Patmos. Now, uh, he writes the, these, these three books. And uh, in, the, in the one book, though, it's kind of interesting. He had one of the coolest nicknames of all time. He was called the Sons of Thunder, him and his brother. You, you remember that? He's the Sons of Thunder. Now, that sounds like a cool motorcycle uh, gang, doesn't it? The Sons of Thunder. And what's cool about John is... Do you remember why he's called that? Why Jesus calls him that? He calls him that because um, Jesus is passing through a village with his disciples and they, don't, they reject him. And so John and James, they get a little ticked about it. They're like, you want us to pray and call down thunder or lightning and just blow this place away? And Jesus just says, no. And, he call, and then he, he nicknames them the sons of, of, uh, sons of thunder there. And what's cool about that, James might have, or John might have been a little like unhinged at that point. But as, when you get to him here in First and Second and 3rd John, he's kind of calmed down and, and he's known as the apostle of love. And so a lot of things changed for John over the years. Um, the other nickname that he goes by is uh, found in his Gospel of John. Does anybody know what, what the nickname is, what he's called? The disciple Jesus loved. That's right. He, he's known by that one. Um, John loved Jesus, and Jesus loved John a lot. They were really close. In fact, so close that when Jesus was on the cross, you'll remember, and he's dying, and before he takes his last breath, he looks at John, and he says to John, take care of my mother. And so from that time on, the Bible says that John takes in Mary, and she lives in his household. So, so just, to, just to say this, when you're on your dying deathbed, and someone looks at you and says, take care of my mother, then you, you're pretty tight with that person. So J John was pretty tight with uh, Jesus, as you all know. Now, so this, that's the author of this great book. And what happened was John began as a young man following Jesus. And now, when he gets to the writing of 1 John, most people think he's an old man, and he's at the end of his life. Um, and there are a number of Christians, when you get to this point, there are a number of Christians who didn't grow up like John. They're second and third generation Christians, and they hadn't seen what John had seen. John had seen what Jesus said, and John had seen all the miracles that Jesus had done. Well, these second and third generation Christians hadn't seen that, and so he's going to write to them, and it's going to be like this. I love this. It's, it's like First John is a Bible study led by Grandpa uh, Pastor John. Because he's an old man, and he writes things like this, my little dear ones. You'll see this as we come, go through this book, my little dear ones. And literally, it's, it's my little ones, right? He's an older man. He's probably in his 90s, and he's been around for a while. And the church has grown. And he, one of the reasons, again, why he wrote this is because uh, false teachers had begun to creep in 
to the church, and they're teaching all kinds of crazy stuff. And 1 John, he calls them deceivers, he calls them antichrists, and he calls them false teachers. Really endearing names, isn't it? But he, you'll see this in this. And what he's doing, he's talking to these new Christians, and what he's saying to them is he wants them to keep their eyes on Jesus. So that's why he, he has written this book. And he says, I don't want you to get distracted. I don't want you to get off course. Keep your eyes on Jesus. So we'll see that in here. Now this morning, what I want to do quickly is look at four verses. Um, and so open your Bible, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. And we'll begin right there. And I, I want to read this all, the first four verses, and then we'll talk about a couple things here. Here's what it says. That which was from the beginning, what you've heard, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we've seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and we write these things to you so that your joy may be complete. Now, again, John writes this, and here's what he's trying to say here, I think, first. There's three things, I, or actually four, I want to point out. The first one, if you stop and think about it, he's saying the reason that he's for sure about all of this stuff is not because, really, um, he's, he, well, it's this. He saw what happened. I think that's the best way to say it. Um, he observed the miracles. He saw the signs that Jesus did. He actually saw them with his own eyes. He says, I saw this stuff, and um, I felt his resurrected body. When Jesus came out of the grave, I touched him. I felt it. He was there. And, and John is saying, this is not just a, just a, uh, a bunch of, of, of really nice principles that's not what, what John's saying here, right? He didn't start believing because he thought this is some nice things, these are some good things to follow or whatever. He says, we embrace this because we saw a guy live, go to the cross, and be crucified. He died, he got put in a tomb, he was there for three days, and three days later he rose again. That's what he's saying here, right? That's, it's, it's important to understand that that's what uh, John is saying. Um, he, it's not just a, um, a, a really a superior way to look at the world. That's not what he's saying here. The proof of Christianity was not how wise Jesus' teachings were. Right? It, it, it's really Jesus was God. He came from heaven. He did these signs. He did these wonderful things. And he rose again. That's the proof. That's the proof of Christianity. One of the best examples, uh, maybe of this, uh, is, is found in, in the Gospel of John. If you read the Gospel of John, there's several stories, but one was about a Jewish man who had been born blind. I don't know if you remember the story. The guy's born blind, right? And to the Jewish people, if you're born blind, then you must have done something really bad. So he, the guy must have done something really bad in the womb. Somebody's getting punished here. So uh, he's been born blind. And Jesus comes along and Jesus heals him, if you remember. And so the Jewish leaders, later on, when they find out what had happened, they come to this guy and they say, they say to him something like, um, there's no way this guy healed you, right? This man's a sinner. He couldn't, have done, he couldn't have done that. This man teaches wrong things. And so I like what the formerly blind guy says. He says this to... Uh, to him, and this is John 9, 25. He says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But said, one thing I do know, that uh, I was blind, but now I see. The proof was in what he did, right? And John says, we, we don't believe this because we can explain it all. We just believe it because we saw it happen. That's what's going on here. We actually touched him. We saw him. We felt the, his wounds, right? And and there's another thing that I was reading this week that a guy brought out that I thought was pretty good. Um, one of the things that you'll find uh, commonly held in our, maybe in our society, is, is this the assumption that re religious truth is subjective truth, right? Um, 
And people kind of treat it as subjective. Let me give you an example. Do you know what subjective and objective truth is? Subjective truth is like this. How many of you are cold in here? Anybody cold right now? Okay, that's your truth because my truth is I'm hot. I'm burning up actually. All right, so, so that's true for you, but for me, I'm warm. So we've all got our own little truth going. That's subjective truth. Objective truth is the capital of Illinois is Springfield. That's not up for debate. That is a true fact. And what John is saying here, there's nothing subjective about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? We, he actually touched him. He felt him. He was there. And that's what, he, that's what he's saying. This has really happened. This is not a fairy tale. This is, was, isn't a once upon a time this happened. Now, again, other religions, you got a guy in Islam, you got a guy that goes into a cave. And I don't know if he was huffing something when he went in there or whatever, but he says he saw an angel and he wrote a bunch of junk down. That's not how Christianity happened. There was a man named Jesus who showed up and he did all of this stuff. Then he goes to the cross and he dies and he goes into a tomb and three days later he rose from the dead. That's Christianity. It happened in real time. That's what he's saying here. That, that's what, he, that's what he, uh, he's pointing out. Now, there's a couple other things that I want to say. I'm sorry if I got a little excited there. Um, there's a couple other things here that I think John is saying. And I don't have time to really go into detail, but I just want to give them both to you because I think they're both really important. The first one I think he's saying here is this, is that Jesus is God. You got to understand that. Um, if you look at John 1.1, 1, 1, he says this, that which was from the beginning. And what this is saying is Jesus is eternal. Um, he's the always Christ. Um, there never was a time he was not. You say, oh, yeah, well, he started in the beginning. No, he was there in the beginning. That, that's different. In fact, John 1, 1 says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? So, so in other words, he's the always Christ. And, and I like uh, one theological book I was looking at said it like this, that Jesus is the pre-existent, co-eternal, co-equal with God the Father. That's very important to know. And in the beginning, that means he was there. He's God. And I want you to understand this because Jehovah Witnesses, they don't, they don't, they don't believe this. Mormons don't believe this. They believe that Jesus was a man and at, at, the, at his baptism, something miraculous happened. Now, we don't believe that. Jesus uh, is, is God from the very beginning, right? He's the always Christ. There never was a time that Jesus was not. That's why he could say that, uh, that he, before Abraham, he was, right? And that little baby was older than his mother and as old as his dad because his dad was God, all right? So, so if you get a knock on the door <laughs> sometime, if you get this knock and, and you find, uh, you, the first thing you do is when that guy comes up on his bike, is probably not answer the door, but we'll get to that in a second. But if you do happen to answer the door because you think it's the mailman bringing some good mail, then you first thing you find out is what do they believe about Jesus? Because if they don't believe Jesus is God, if, that he's co-eternal, that he's, that, uh, that, that he's pre-existent, those kinds of things, then you got to shut it off right there. You immediately know that this person is in a cult because we believe, Bible-believing Christians believe that Jesus is God, all right? In fact, here's what John said in 2 John 1.10. He said, if anyone comes to your door and brings not the doctrine of Christ, don't receive them into your house, neither bid them Godspeed. He says, don't even answer the door, right? Now, I'm going to skip that. Now, so first of all, God, Jesus is God. The second thing that's real important about this, and he brings this out in here, is Jesus was man. Jesus was God, and Jesus was man. Now look at verse 1 again. It says, that which we was from the beginning, which we have heard, now check it out, which we have seen with our eyes, and we have looked upon, and our hands have handled him of the word of life. And one of the big reasons, y'all, uh, that John wrote this is there was this heresy in the church. Um, it was called Gnosticism. Now, some of you are familiar with it. If you've taught the Bible for very long, you know this. It comes after the Greek word gnosis. 
And what that means is to know. That's what gnosis means. Is it comes from the verb to know. And there were people called the Gnostics back then um, that they said that they had superior knowledge or superior wisdom. They were in the know. That's why they're called Gnostics, right? Um, and these Gnostics, they, believe, they say, yeah, we believe in Jesus, just like the Jehovah Witnesses do. But they say, um, but he didn't actually have a human body. They believed that he was something like uh, Casper the ghost, the friendly ghost. And, um, but he, he appeared as a spirit, but he didn't have a human body, right? So they didn't believe in the incarnation, and they didn't believe in the humanity of Jesus Christ. That's the Gnostics. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why he wrote this. I want you to think with me. Here's the thing. Think about Jesus for a second. It's absolutely fundamental that you understand that Jesus was God. And that, that's a really big deal. Um, but it's just as important that you understand that Jesus was also human. Right? You got you to gotta believe in his humanity too. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. But it's an absolute falsehood if you don't believe that Jesus was both God and Jesus was man. Now, he wasn't half God and half man. He was all God and he was all man, right? John 1.14 says this, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, when Jesus was here in the flesh, listen, y'all, he felt what I felt. He feels what you, you felt. In fact, it, the Bible says in Hebrews that at all points he was tempted just like you and I. Right? Um, and when he lived his life here in the flesh, he was dependent. He lived his life dependent on God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Right? And he, in fact, um, he, he had to depend on him just like you and I have to depend on the Holy Spirit. And, and what I'm trying to say is if when you read Philippians, he didn't try to pull rank. Right? Uh, he never performed a miracle outside of what the Spirit led him to and God the Father. And therefore, y'all, he's my example. He's, he's your example. And if you take away his humanity, then part of what you're taking away is his example. And I'll tell you another thing you're taking away. If you take away the fact that Jesus was human and he just showed up in a spirit, then you take away his blood atonement. Now, the word atonement, if you say, well, what, you're just using big words, Joe. Maybe you know this one or not. Atonement means at one minute. All right? The Bible teaches that you and I are separated from God because of our sin. And, we, and what happened is when Jesus goes to the cross, he brings about at one minute so that we can be at one with God through the shed blood and the sacrifice that he makes on the cross. Now, if he wasn't human, if he was Casper the ghost, then he didn't shed his blood. Therefore, we have a problem. So, the, so you, have, you have to say he was both God and he was both man. All right? Any other version, a lot of people, if you... In other words, if you go to the History Channel, if you go to the Learning Channel or Unlearning Channel, whatever you want to call it, and you, you'll have these things on Jesus. And a lot of times they'll say, well, Jesus was a big ball of energy. Or they'll say, he was a good man or he was a good leader. No. No. Any other version of Jesus other than the fact that he was both God and man is hogwash. That's what he's saying here. Can I say hogwash from the pulpit? Okay. And what he's saying in verse 3 is that won't lead to fellowship with God. Right? And it won't lead to relationship with God. All right, now look for la lastly, because i got to hurry, look at verse 4, and we'll be done. One of the reasons why he wrote this, not only was the straightened doctrine out, but he wrote it... Um, for what he says in verse 4. And there's a couple of these in this, in, here in the scripture. Look what he says in verse 4. And we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. John says one of the reasons why he wrote this book is for your joy. And if I know anything about everybody in here is you're all about your joy. Now he's not talking about your happiness, all right? Happiness comes from the word happenstance, which means your circumstance. It's related to your circumstance. You can be happy or you can be sad. And if you're happy, it's because your circumstance, all that's going good. Joy is way deeper than that. Joy has to do with no matter what your circumstances are, you got that inner peace, that excitement going on. Um, when you have a real 
relationship with Jesus Christ, there's joy. All right? Uh, you got joy. One of the byproducts of salvation is joy. Now, I thought about this. You say, well, Joe, I've been a Christian for 30 years, and I don't have any joy. Right? Then here's what I'll tell you. Then something's happened. Something has taken your joy. See, when you're in a relationship with the Lord, there, there, there's joy. And if there's not joy in your life and you're a Christian right now, you need to do some soul searching. You need to check it out because Jesus said over and over again, one of the reasons he came, listen, listen what he said in John 15, 11. He says, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Uh, John 17, 13, I, could, there's a, I got a bunch of these. He says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Now, do you remember when you first came to Jesus? You remember when you first got saved, how excited you were? That's, that's the joy we're talking about. Do you remember the first time that God used you and maybe somebody was saved or, or, or you really, God led you to somebody and you, you helped them and how excited you were that God used you and, and you just had that joy? That's, that's where it comes from, right there. And let me tell you this, not only that, but I'll tell you, that joy there that he's talking about is contagious. People like to be around people with that joy. Now, you know why people don't want to be around a lot of Christians today? Because they ain't got that joy. You ever been around a downer Christian? They call them Debbie Downers. You know, those, those Christians that, that suck all the air out of the room. No one wants to be around those people. But a joyous Christian is contagious. It's contagious, and, and, I, and I was thinking about this whole thing. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we kind of gripe and moan because we look around at the world, and you watch the news, and you see all the bad stuff going on. Anybody see all that bad? If you watch, I don't even recommend it. <laughs> That'll steal your joy. Just watch the news for five minutes. If you're a Cub fan, watch ESPN, and you see all the losing they're doing. Anyways, I digress. But you watch all the bad things going on in this world, and you go, well, maybe, maybe our message is, is just not effective anymore. The, the problem is not the message. The problem with the church today is us. See, one of the things you're going to find when we, when, when we get into this book is that joy was contagious, and I'll prove it to you in just a second, but that joy was contagious People wanted to know what they had that they didn't. And the church grew. It grew even though, if you think about this, when John was around, people didn't like Christians. And I, I can go into a lot of reasons why, but the, the, the society was pluralistic. There were a million gods. Um, it was relativistic. It was spiritual, but it was anti-Christian in nature. And I got to ask you, even with all that going on when Christianity started, it flourished. And you look around today and you see all the problems in our society, people shooting people up. There's all kinds of bad things you could say about But the gospel, the, there's nothing wrong with the message. The problem is the Christians. The problem is the church. And until we recognize that, we're going to be stuck where we are. The problem is us. It's not the message. Right? And in 300 years, when, when he penned this, when he penned this, 300 years after he, the, uh, John penned this letter, Christianity had taken over the Roman Empire. About 300 years. And, and I just got to say this, it could happen again. It could happen again. The message is powerful. You know, and we can talk about all the problems. I don't want to do that. I want to say this message is powerful and we got to, the problem is we just got to fix it. We, we got to take this to the Lord and let him fix us. I, I don't know about you, but I was thinking about this. Have you lost your joy of your salvation? If you have, 
Uh, one of the reasons why he wrote this is so that you'll have your joy. So here's what I'm saying. Get into it. Read, read this book. We'll be in the next several verses. Read that. See what he has to say because he's going to challenge us. He's got a lot of hard things to say, but he's got a lot of awesome things to say too. And I just challenge you, where are you at? Because there's nothing wrong with the message. The problem is us. The message is still as powerful today and can break down anything. You know, um, maybe, maybe part of it is they were all having to die for their faith and we're, we just got to be uncomfortable, you know, sometime and get in a room that's either hot or cold. You know, that's the worst suffering we do for Christ sometimes. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning, and, and Lord, we thank you that you're, you're both God and you're man, and what happened was real. We, we have a, something that really happened. This is not just a bunch of made-up stuff. This really happened in time. God, we put our, our, our faith and trust in that. We don't put our faith and trust in a politician. We don't put our faith and our, our trust in, in uh, money or any of these things that the world has to offer. We put our faith and trust in you. And God, some of us maybe in here this morning, if we were honest, maybe that's not where our faith and trust is right now. We need to come back to you. And Lord, what's good about you is you never give up on us. And even when we fail, you're right there with your arms open. And God, if we'll run to you, if we'll repent, if we'll confess it, that, that God, you, you, you restore us and you put us back to work. So Lord, I, I just pray for each one in here. God, do your work in this church. We want to see Ducoin taken over by the gospel. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me. So come to this invitation time. It's for you. Maybe you want to come this morning and pray at the altar. You can pray for our church. Maybe for your family. Maybe you need to make a decision public today. Whatever you'd like to do. We want to give you an opportunity right now just to kind of talk to God about whatever he said to you today. And, and so we'll give you that chance. So as uh, Kevin leads us and, and Jackie plays, you do what God's leading you to do. Can you hear me now? 
I want to introduce y'all to some folks that you probably already know, but I'm going to have them come on up here. I said, don't call him Bob, so I'm not going to. I'm going to call him Peck. <laughs> this is Peck and Carolyn Boyette. And uh, so a lot of y'all know them because they were here before. When I first came here, y'all were here. And then uh, they got called to, he called a pastor at Ava Missionary Baptist Church down in Ava. And he's since retired yep. in the last, when, when, how long has it been now? Since 30th of June. 30th of June. So uh, he's been back and we are so glad to have him. Amen. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit further, but they're coming today to say to you this. And did you tell me this is the third time? At least third or fourth. Third or fourth time that they've come and joined our church. So we're glad to have them back. Fourth time. So uh, that may be a record. I don't know. But uh, if we're going to pray, <laughs> we're going to pray. Are, uh, are you excited about this decision? Yes. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so we're going to pray. And at the end of the prayer, if you would come by and, and give them the right hand of fellowship, just tell them you're glad to, that uh, they're with us. Amen. All right. And so I think John Whitmer is going to close us out. And uh, so God bless you. If you would stand as we close out in prayer. Uh, Brother Joe was talking about Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I had the opportunity for two young men to come by uh, my house and speak with me. So I got to share with them. Uh, I feel like God brought them to my door, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but there's opportunities out, out there to share the gospel with people. So uh, they were coming to me, and I kind of had a captive audience. So uh, it was kind of a good thing. So we can all, all, God will work things out for us, you know. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I, dear Lord, I give you praise and honor and glory because you are worthy. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day that we can come and, and hear your word proclaimed. Dear Lord, I pray that we will take your word and, and share it with the, those around about us, those in our community and to other places, dear Lord. I thank you for Peck and uh, Carolyn to, as they come to us. Uh, I pray that uh, we will be a blessing to them, and I know they will bless this church and work for this church, dear Lord. Uh, dear Lord, I pray for those who are in need of your special care. There are many people out there that are hurting and suffering. Dear Lord, I pray that their needs will, will be met according to your will. Dear Lord, I pray, pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Bless them and bless those who are uh, in need of salvation in Ukraine, dear Lord. Uh, be with us as we go from this place. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, 